Hello everybody, this is Tim again here for my review for Nightmare Never Street 3, The Dream Warriors, which is my favorite sequel. Just go ahead and get out my four pack here. Just to get it into focus if I can. The makeup in this film I like. It's a little bit more theatrical and less of a burn victim kind of look, but it's still cool. Um, I think Kevin Yeager does the makeup. Kevin Yeager does the makeup effects in this one too, I believe. Uh, my favorite makeup is still part two, but I still really like the makeup in this film. You got Patricia Arquette in the film as a character named Kristen. Um, you kind of get the idea that her mom doesn't pay enough attention to her and stuff. And the, At the beginning of the film, you get an opening nightmare, just like all the rest of these films. And this opening nightmare, I enjoy. She's uh, like making a paper mache version of the Elm Street house, and it looks really good. You can tell that she's probably an ace in art class. I wish I actually had that version of the Elm Street house. <clears throat> Sorry, muscle cramp. But anyway, so she's having a nightmare at the beginning, and she's like going into the Elm Street house. And there's like this little girl she's following, and uh, she's like, "This is where uh, he takes us." And all at once, like the boiler, the boiler like lights up with fire, and she goes, "Freddy's home." And I, I love that line. That's a great line, one of the best in the series. And uh, so Petra Sharkent grabs her and takes off running, and she like fucking gets stuck in this mud. And Robert Englund's like running up behind her. Uh, well, Freddy's running up behind her, and he like fucking. Uh, takes his arm and he's like Phew, and slashes her like, like at the last second she jumps out of the way and misses that's cool um so she's getting away and then she fucking like well you can tell the, one of the problems here is you can tell like the little girl and uh, Patricia Kent's arms is like a doll you can tell the special effect is kind of weak but uh then she looks around in the room and there's like all these bodies like hanging everywhere like just hanging from nooses all over the place that's cool i enjoyed that that was a cool scene um she wakes up or you think she woke up and this is cool like a dream within a dream thing i like this she goes to the bathroom you're going to wash her hands almost the fucking knobs like come out and grab her arm like twist it around like that that was cool i really enjoyed that and then Freddy like fucking appears in the mirror, and her mom like comes in at the last second, and she and it kind of looks like she was in there like slitting her wrist. And her mom thinks, of course, it was a suicide attempt, so she takes her to Weston Hills, the psychiatric facility that's also in uh, Freddy vs. Jason. <clears throat> so she's there, and the rest of the kids there are the last remaining survivors of the Elm Street kids. And in between the second movie and this one, like all the uh, kids, like Elm Street kids, have been wiped off one by one in like ways where it looks like suicide, but of course it's actually Freddy. Uh, they kind of you never find out what happened to the characters from part two, which pissed me off. Once again, I hope someone makes a comic or an anime series about that. I'm very interested in what happened to those fucking characters. But uh, and also the Elm Street house looks way worse than what it should uh, because the second film isn't. We was fine in the second film, and the gap between two and three isn't too wide I don't think but still it still looks really cool and awesome and it will continue it will probably it will continue to look like this for the rest of the series well until Freddy vs Jason when they fix it back up but so she's at Weston Hills and she like doesn't want to put him to sleep obviously doesn't want them to put her to sleep um, she's like got a scalpel and threatening to cut the shit out of him if they try and then in comes Nancy Thompson our my one of, well my second favorite hero of the whole franchise she's there and she's like well Kristen is like singing the Freddy nursery rhyme, and uh, and Nancy like completes it. So obviously they're kindred spirits from then on. The Kristen character isn't really like the hero of the film. She's more like a Nancy sidekick kind of. This film was more like a group effort, hence the title Dream Warriors. I don't really think there's one single hero in the film. But uh, but she completes the nursery rhyme that Kristen's singing, so Kristen knows that you know. Obviously Nancy knows, you know about Freddy and what's going on and everything so they become friends and she like looks up to Nancy and everything now once again in this film you get really creative dream sequences that I love you get some really cool shit in this one um, uh, Christian is having a dream like this little bicycle comes into her room tricycle and it fucking starts like melting and so she winds up in the Elm Street house again you got like she looks on the table and this fucking pig like lunges out at her and barks in a really cool uh, scene and all at once the room starts like getting tore apart, and then this big fucking Freddy snake uh, like comes up out of the ground, which almost looks like a dick, but it's coated in green slime. So uh, I guess you could say it's a Freddy snake instead of a Freddy penis. But it grabs her and like starts trying to eat her. And Kristen has the ability to pull people into her dreams, you know, hence the title Dream Warriors. So all the 
remaining Elm Street kids have dream of, dream powers, which is really cool. So she, of course, you know, brings Nancy in. Nancy comes in there, takes a piece of, like a shard of glass, and fucking rams it in the Freddy dick or snake's eye, and that causes him to like drop right out of its mouth. And then it raise, uh, the Freddy snake raises up and looks at Nancy and goes, "You." <laughs> Obviously, he remembers her from the first film. Um, so, so after that, uh, Christian like uh, uses her dream power. She can also like wake herself up, I guess, or take them out of the dream world, which is pretty interesting. I don't remember her using that in part four. The characters in that one as well. You'd think she would use that in that one, but I don't. But I think that by the time, well, I don't think she gets a chance to in part four. I think she gets knocked out with sleeping pills in that one by her mom. But we'll get to that. But anyway. So she has the ability to take him out of the dream world too, I guess. So she takes him out of there. The next morning, of course, Nancy's talking to her about it and everything. And yeah, uh, you get some really, uh, really cool dream deaths in this one and dream sequences. I love the dream sequences in this film. Like you got this kid who makes puppets and everything, and one of the puppets actually comes and looks to life while the kid's asleep. And the character's name's Philip. And the fucking like puppet turns into Freddy, and he takes his claws and like. Cuts the strings and he falls down. The little Freddy puppet does, and he walks over there and slashes like down, eat like his arms like that through his uh tendons. Like his fucking tendons comes out and he walks in like a marionette or a puppet, and, like walks into the top of this building and then uh, you can see Freddy up in the sky and Freddy's like and slashes the fucking uh, <laughs> tendons and uh, the character Philip falls all the way down off the building to his death. Of course, they think it's suicide. You get Craig Watson in this film. Craig Watson is an actor I like and I enjoy, and I don't think we see him in enough stuff. Uh, I'm happy to see him here as a character called Dr. Neil Gordon, I believe. He wants to help the kids and help them. He's got a partner named Dr. Sims who's like this bitchy asshole woman who just won't listen to anything. But uh, Dr. Neil, uh, he's fine. He really wants to help the kids and everything, and he kind of makes friends with Nancy, and he's pretty much like her love interest. Ted Lincoln Camp's performance in this film is is much weaker than it was in the first film, mostly because it doesn't seem like her heart's in it, like she's really wanting to deliver a really good performance this time. Kind of like she's disappointed that Wes Craven wasn't directing, because this was based off Wes Craven's script, but uh, a lot of fans know that the script was changed like a whole lot. They changed a lot of stuff from Wes Craven's script and just kind of kept the basic idea. And they also put a... <clears throat> Sorry, they also put a lot of humor and stuff in it that wasn't there in the Craven script, I don't think. Yes, Freddy is not as dark as the first or second film in this, and his scenes when he shows up are like the way they're lit are more lighter, and you can see more of the makeup stuff in his face, so he's not as dark. And you get some <laughs> kind of silly stuff in here. This is the beginning of the more pop culture Freddy, so you get some kind of silly stuff in here. <clears throat> no matter what version of Freddy you're doing, I think as long as you do it good enough and the jokes are funny. I'll be okay with it. As long as it's a good movie, I really don't care what version it is, to be honest. But you get some stuff in here It kind of felt awkward to me. Like, you get this girl who, like, wants to be a TV star, and she has a fucking dream. It's like Zaza Gabor getting interviewed by Dick Cavett, and Dick Cavett's like, can I ask you something? And she's talking about, well, Zaza Gabor's talking about, like, how to how to be an actress and how to succeed at being an actress. And Dick Cavett's like, can I ask you something? Not once she transforms into Freddy, and he's like, who gives a fuck what you think? And then slashes at her. It's funny, and it is entertaining, and I like it, but it just feels weird seeing Freddy on a fucking talk show. But as long as they're done right, these, these scenes like this, the more comical scenes, as long as they're done right in a way that flows with the film, I don't have a problem with them, and most of them are done right. But still, seeing Freddy on a talk show like that, not just a little personal gripe for me, but it still flows well for the film. But, uh, and then all at once you get Freddy's head, like, come out of the fucking television, he grabs the character Jennifer, who's the one that wants to be a TV star, fucking, like, says, welcome to prime time, bitch, and then rams her head into the television. That was great. <laughs> that was oh, fucking hilarious. All through the movie, the character Neil is, like, being visited by this nun, who at the end you find out is actually Freddy's mom, which I like that idea. Of like Freddy's mom's spirit coming back to like tell him, you know, like uh, how to defeat Freddy. But she waits like halfway through the movie before she tells him if she had this information already. Like she just tell him the first moment she's seen him. But whatever. <laughs> On that, that's kind of weird. Um, when this film, you find she tells Doctor Neil like more backstory about Freddy. Like he finds out that uh, that Freddy, uh, Freddy's mom was like a nun that was accidentally locked in the insane asylum on the holidays. Like during the holidays, and she was raped by the inmates like hundreds of times, and they found her she was pregnant, so hence the title, Son of a Hundred Maniacs, so Freddy was obviously her baby. Um, so that's pretty neat. A little bit theatrical, 
But uh, still cool and neat. I like that idea. It's a cool idea. But you know that Freddy was obviously going to be slightly fucked up from birth, at least a little bit. Um, if not a lot. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, that was some decent backstory. Other characters, you get the character of Kincaid. I like Kincaid. He's funny. <laughs> he cracks me up. He's one of my favorite characters in the franchise and in this film. I think he's hilarious. Like, Dr. Sims is, like, telling him about what she thinks, like, it is making these nightmares and stuff. And she's, like, overt sexuality or repressed sexuality or something like that. She tells him that that's got something to do with it. And Kincaid's like, oh, it's my dick that's killing me. <laughs> no, wait, he says, now it's my dick that's killing me. And I thought, I thought that was so funny. Um, for the characters in this film, since you have more, they got like a group thing in this film where they talk to the like all the characters at once and they introduce themselves and stuff. And so that's that's a good idea, script wise. It lets you know the characters and lets them you know get out who they are and stuff. I like that. Um, uh, later on in the film, of course, after two deaths, you know, Doctor Neil is like wanting to you know, fucking do something about this. So Nancy tells him, like, what's going on with the whole Freddy thing and everything. He decides to give it a shot, and so uh, they do a group hypnosis thing, and they're trying to, like, learn how to use the dreams, and they all have their dream powers. And it gets a little cheesy here, like the wizard master kid who's this character, Will, is in a wheelchair. He kind of looks like Harry Potter a little bit, but he has, like, a, he has the magical powers, and he, like, he calls himself the wizard master, and he, like, takes a ball and makes it into a little bird, you know, it flies out of his hand. It's kind of cute, but kind of cheesy. Then you got the most horrible line in the franchise I've heard, where, um, or one of the most horrible lines, where this character, Taryn, is like a, got a mohawk. She's like this punk rock chick, and she was like a drug user, you find out in the film. And she fucking like takes these switchblades and clicks them up. She's got like a giant ass punk rock mohawk. Uh, and she's like, in my dreams, I'm beautiful and bad. And that was so fucking cheesy. I could have done without that. <laughs> but, uh, and you got this character, Joey, who, like, doesn't speak because he's so traumatized, and his weakness is basically his, his horniness. His horniness is his weakness. He's, like, wanting to fuck this nurse in the movie, and then the, during the group scene where they're all, like, practicing their powers, he, like, wanders off to go fuck the nurse because he doesn't know it's a dream yet, or none of the characters do. So he, like, wanders off to go fuck the nurse, and then the nurse is, like, she takes off her clothes and you see her tits and everything. Nice, nice tits. Good scene. Uh... <laughs> Then it transforms into Freddy. Oh shit, that is my worst nightmare. Fucking a hot chick and it turned into Freddy. That's pretty bad. But, uh, and then all at once, like, his fucking tongue is, like, attached to the nurse's tongue. And, like, he pulls on it. And all at once, the nurse, like, starts shooting out tongues and fucking, like, wraps his arms and legs to the bed. And then the nurse transforms into Freddy. And you get a pretty fucking cheesy line where Freddy's like, What's wrong, Joey? Feeling tongue tied? And he fucking, like, the bed falls out and under him is, like, a portal to hell or something. So Freddy takes Joey hostage to lure the other ones into the dream world so he can just wipe them all out at once. Um, but then you get a scene where like all the rest of them's there and they realize that Freddy's attacking. And they're all in there in the room where they're practicing their dream powers. And the fucking like room starts collapsing and closing in on them. And no matter what they do, they can't get out of there. So I'm thinking, if Freddy can just destroy them like that and just one group like that, just one attack... That kind of demeans the characters of the Dream Warriors because I'm hoping that, you know, these will be a these will be a group of people, you know, who can actually do something against Freddy, but it doesn't really seem that way. It seems like they can fight him and maybe hold him off, but it seems like he's still smarter than them and still more powerful and he can still whip out shit that they couldn't even think about or dream of. <laughs> no pun intended. But uh, it kind of demeans the characters a little for me. But you could also say they're just now getting used to their powers, so maybe they don't even know what to do. And Kincaid's got, like, super strength. Um, <clears throat> Joey, you find out later, has fucking super sound. Um, the nun basically tells uh, Dr. Neil that the only way to defeat Freddy is to find his bones and give him a proper burial um, with holy water and a cross. So that's obviously entertaining. He has to be buried in hollowed ground. So that's pretty... Uh, so that's... I mean, that's... Obviously going to be a pretty entertaining way to kill the character. I mean, I think that's a good way to kill the character. That's an interesting way, and I think it makes sense. You know, lay the spirit to rest, and, you know, he won't be able to come back anymore. That makes sense. Well, obviously not, because there's a 4, 5, 6, and a Freddy vs. Jason, and a shitty remake, but we'll get to those. But, uh, <laughs> and Nancy in the film, she takes this stuff called Hypnosil, which is kind of like Freddy's kryptonite, and it keeps people from dreaming, so it's kind of a pretty major thing to keep, uh, keep away Freddy. I mean, pretty much if you take that, and Freddy, he can't do shit against you. So, that's what they're wanting to get. So, Dr. Neil and Nancy, they head out to go fucking try to get some Hypnosil. Mm. And, uh, well, at, well, first, they can't get to the Hypnosil, I don't think. So, what they want to do is just try to 
Well, the the nun, the mysterious nun, that's <laughs> well, Doctor Neil is like talking about her, talking about how they can like bury his bones and everything, and so they decide to go to the one man, and instead of getting hit in the seal, they decide to go to the one man who knows, like a. Uh, well, no way. I remember now. They get they get pretty much booted out from their position because Doctor Sims blames them or puts the blame on those two, Doctor Neil and Nancy, but for what's happened to uh, Joey being in a coma. But he's really being held by Freddy. But of course, Doctor Sims don't know that. So uh, instead, they decide to go bury his bones because that's what the nun told uh, Doctor Neil. Um, so him and Nancy go find the one man who knows where they're at. It's her dad, John Saxon again, baby. I like this. I like bringing him back. That's cool for continuity wise. I enjoy that. Um, so they go to him, but he doesn't want to help, and he's obviously been demoted to a security guard. He's no longer, like, the lieutenant of the fucking police force. He's now a security guard. We pay attention to the badge on his shoulder, I believe. Um, so he knows where the bones are. Nancy, like, gets a phone call that, uh, um, um, it's either Nancy or Dr. Neil gets a phone call. I don't really remember. I didn't, um, I don't know why I blanked out on that part. I've seen the movie a thousand times, and I can't believe I'm blanking out on that part. But uh, one of them gets a phone call. Well, no, it's, it's Neil who gets a phone call. I remember. I don't know why I blanked out. It's Neil who gets a phone call, and the kids basically tell him that um, Dr. Sims has, uh, well, Christian took a shit attack and started acting crazy because she was mad about Nancy being fired. And Dr. Sims doped her up and put her in the quiet room and put her to sleep. Um, so they all have to, they all want to go in and try to save her and try to defeat Freddy. So uh, Dr. Neil, who got the phone call, he tells Nancy what happened. Nancy fucking decides to go out and try to uh, uh tries to go there so she can try to help the kids. Dr. Neil tries to convince uh John Saxton, you know, to fucking tell him where the bones are so they can uh, bury them and kill Freddy. Um give him a proper burial. And they're at this junkyard and what's funny is they're going to try to bury him in the junkyard and the nun specifically said hollow ground. So that's a plot hole. It is a plot hole. But it's not too big of a plot hole. She said specifically hollow ground, Dr. Neil. But he decides to bury him in the junkyard, <clears throat> so but it's not too big a deal. It's just a little minor plot hole, not not a big deal. So they decide to go in to the dream world. Uh, Nancy does, along with the rest of the kids who are left, so they can try to defeat Freddy. Um, they're all in the quiet room and fucking claws so like ripping through all the padding. It's pretty cool. I really enjoy that. And then the they're all fucking like separated. Kristen has a dream where it's like the beginning of the movie, and she thinks like the whole entire movie was a dream. And she's like there in her room with her mom listening to fucking Dawkin again. I forgot Dawkins at the beginning of the movie. I know it's like a different song in some versions, but in mine it was Into the Fire, <laughs> which I liked by Dawkins Into the Fire. I believe that's what it's called. At least that's what the lyric said in it, but it was still awesome. But uh, that was cool. Dawkins being in the movie is awesome. Um, but yeah, it's, she thinks the whole thing was a dream, and then her mom, her mom's like. Kristen, I got a guest. I got to leave. You know, just go to sleep. And she's like, please, Mom, I don't want to be alone. And all at once, uh, you hear some guy hollering down, where's the bourbon? And all at once, Freddie grabs her, and he's like in a tuxedo. And he says, I said, where's the fucking bourbon? And he cuts her head off, and her head's like talking to Kristen. And she's like, every time I bring a man home, you ruin it for me. <laughs> that was so funny. I like that. Seeing Freddie in a tux is funny. Like I said, as long as the comedy's done right and balanced with the horror, it's not too big a deal. And this movie balances the scary and funny Freddy the best of the franchise. But uh, she does a backflip. Freddy tries to stab her. He misses. She jumps out a fucking window, which was pretty entertaining. She's now in the Elm Street house. Next scene, you got Freddy going after Tyron. Uh, she's got like a – she's in like this alley, like this old alleyway. It looks you – know where she used to drugs, do drugs at, I guess. She uh, Freddy shows up there. She's got two switchblades. She's like, okay, asshole, let's dance. So that was a funny line. She starts swinging them at him. They get into a pretty decent fight here. Um, Freddy manages to cut her on the leg. She stabs him like right under the arm, right through here, I believe. Very interesting. Pretty interesting fight, decent. But of course, Freddy, you know, dominates here because he uses her fear against her and gets the better of her. His hand, his fingers turn to fucking crack needles, and he jabs them into like these little suckers on her arms right here. And that's a that's a cool idea, creative another creative dream thing. That was neat. I like the I like it when they when the Filmmakers do creative stuff in the dreams. I love that. Those are my favorite parts of these films is the dreams. Um, and then uh, he fucking just stabs her with the needles, and you get a really funny Freddy line, what a rush, <laughs> which is funny. And then the next scene, you got uh, Freddy going up against the magic kid, the wizard master, the character Will, who is in a wheelchair but can walk in his dreams. Um, 
he's like uh he fucking like shoots for uh, well freddy like takes his chair and like turns into like some hell version of his chair and like says it's the chair for you kid and fucking it flies at him tries to run him over and he like dodges it. well he gets hit by it and just like nicked on the leg then he blows it up with his magical powers and then shoots freddy with his powers and then that's fine but this scene right here, I'll never forgive the movie for. This is so fucking stupid. He's, like, blasting the shit out of Freddy, like, with the magic coming out of his fingers. And he runs right up next to Freddy, like, this fucking close. Why? Why? And he gets that close, and then Freddy just grabs him, and, of course, he kills him. He, I do like this line, though, where Freddy's, like, holding him up, and Robert Englund's like, Sorry, kid, I don't believe in fairy tales. And then he fucking, like, stabs him in the chest and, like, rips his heart out, I believe, and looks at it. That was funny. I like that death scene. <laughs> That kid deserved to die for him to get so close like that. That was so fucking stupid. Then you get the next scene. You got three people left, basically. You got Nancy. Well, Na we got four, actually. Joey's kidnapped. But you got Nancy, uh, Kristen, and uh, Kincaid. They're all three there. And it's funny because Kincaid's like, Freddy's a pussy. He's hiding from us and everything. And then this fucking like, door pops up out of nowhere. It's like Freddy challenging him. So <laughs> that was funny. The way Kincaid's like, calling Freddy a pussy and everything. Um, they, uh, the door opens up, and it's, like, got a whole room inside of it, despite the fact that it's, like, just, like, a little thin door, and there's, like, nothing behind it, but there's, like, a whole, like, another world, and no, a whole another world inside the door, which I thought was entertaining. So they go into the door, they go down there, Freddy's got, uh, Joey hostage, and he's like, look, Joey, all the little piggies come home. <laughs> Robert England's lines in this film are great, I love them. Um, so they uh, they they make it down there and, and uh, Kristen does like a front flip and like knocks uh, Freddie down. Freddie does a fucking the uh, and the front flip and like lands up on his feet. I believe is what you call it a front flip. Lands up on his feet. He swings at her. She dodges it and then he like uh, fucking knocks her out with his other arm. I believe. Uh, Kincaid stabs him through the gut. Um, um, no, not Kincaid. He grabs uh, Kincaid hits him with a pop and then he grabs Kincaid and he's like holding him up. And then. Uh, Fucking Nancy jabs him through the gut with a poker. He pulls it out and then licks it and then fucking slings it down in a pretty gross scene, but it's entertaining. She's like, Freddy's never been this strong before. And uh, he fucking like pulls off his shirt and he's like, it's the souls of the children. And this is the first movie that's in the series that's introduced the concept of Freddy like absorbing the souls. And it's really cool seeing like the chest of souls and everything. That's a cool idea. That was a really, really cool idea. I'm not sure if Wes Craven came up with that or who did, but that was a really cool idea. Um, him absorbing the souls like that is a really cool idea. And so he, like, senses that Dr. Neil and, uh, you know, uh, Nancy's father are fucking, like, burying his bones and are messing with him. So he, like, fades out of there, goes to the real world. And you get a funny scene here where all the cars and the junkyards start acting up. And, uh, fucking, uh, um, uh, John Saxon, like, goes, bury the fucking thing. He looks at the uh, Dr. Neil and goes, bury the fucking thing. And it's, it's just funny seeing him say that. He runs over there and like Freddy's skeleton pops up out of the bag and then starts fighting him and then uh, he uh, he kills Nancy's dad, um, he kills Donald, uh, fucking grabs him like this and like stabs him in the gut and lifts him up and then swings him like on this conveniently placed spike in the junkyard. A uh, decent death. I kind of wish he would have got to do more because you get the idea in the franchise that he's the like he was the leader of the mob that burnt Freddy. So you, I kind of wish that he could have done more in the film, but he doesn't really get to do much. But him coming back, though, is still sweet, and I still love it. This is the true sequel to the first movie. Um, so he's dead. He beats the skeleton, beats the shit out of Craig Watson <laughs> uh, in, like, a matter of seconds, which is kind of silly. He doesn't even seem like he puts up much of a fight against the skeleton. But it's still decently entertaining. So he knocks him out with a shovel, knocks him down into the fucking hole where they was going to bury him. Uh, and then he, of course, he unpossesses his own bones and then goes back to the dream world to finish off the rest of the dream warriors i'm i'm sorry guys just just a second i'm sorry my fucking legs were killing me but anyway to finish off this um to finish off this review here so he goes back into the dream world he's gonna uh, then you get this really cool fucking badass like hall of mirrors this whole room is like filled with mirrors and fucking freddy pops up on one of them and he goes sorry to keep you waiting perhaps if there was more of me to spread around and all these fucking freddies pop up on all these mirrors and it's, it's so funny though like freddy's like doing tongue action and some of them like wiggling his tongue <laughs> and then sorry burp i just had a drink a while ago <laughs> before i started this review i guess it's just now coming out but uh, and all these Freddies like stuck in, start fucking like jumping out and grabbing each one of the Dream Warriors, including Nancy, and like trying to pull her into the dreams. 
Of course, they've saved Joey now. Um, Joey, like, does, like, a, he finds his dream power and does, like, a supersonic fucking scream and busts all the mirrors and the dream warriors and Nancy come flying out of them so they're all saved. And this, I'll never forgive the movie for this. This is, this is so fucking stupid. I will not forgive the movie for this. This is what kind of knocks it down below the first movie for me. Um, they actually think that everything they've done that's had no effect on Freddy, that Joey's fucking supersonic sound has killed Freddy. And I'm like, what? Give me a break. And then Freddy uh, appears you know, in disguise as Nancy's dad, saying he crossed over, you know, into the spirit world or whatever. Or, no, he crossed over into the dream world before he crosses over into the spirit world to tell her that he's sorry for any bad times they had during their relationship or whatever. And I'm like, and Nancy believes it. She thinks it's her dad. And I'm like, what the fuck? This is kind of like in the script. They were like, all right, we got to kill off Nancy in this movie to have some kind of heartfelt moment. But how do we do it in a clever way? We can't think anything. Shit. Just make her stupid for this one second. <laughs> I thought that was fucking just lazy. That was lazy. That was so stupid. If you're going to kill off Nancy, she's a main character, and she's my second favorite character of the franchise. Hero-wise, second favorite hero. Um, if you're going to kill her off, kill her off in a way that's respectable to the character, not something stupid like Halloween Resurrection. Um, <clears throat> but this isn't as bad as that. But uh, this is still pretty stupid. The fact that she falls for this. And of course she goes up to him and starts hugging him. She's like, I always love you, Dad. And he transforms into Freddy and fucking stabs her right in the gut and goes, Die! <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck did you expect? You deserve to die for being that fucking stupid. And so he, like, Freddy, like, the door, like, closes behind Christian, who's happened to be standing in the same room. The rest of the other two dream warriors, Joey and Kincaid, are locked out. And so it's pretty much just... He's just going to try to kill Christian now. He tries to kill her. He knocks her down on the ground. He gets ready to kill her. Nancy comes. I, I do like this. Nancy doesn't give up. She still keeps coming. She grabs a hold of Freddy from behind, grabs his fucking uh, glove and his hand when he's getting ready to stab Christian and jams it to him and jams it in his fucking chest. And that was that was awesome. I love that. That was badass. Shows you what a badass Nancy is. I love that. Um, and so after that, uh, of course, Freddy's screaming in pain. And this, I kind of don't like this either. The movie's called Dream Warriors, but the Dream Warriors aren't don't even really defeat Freddy at all. It's pretty much a combination between the, between the Dream Warriors and uh, and uh, Doctor Neil, really. <laughs> They're the ones that all they all defeat Freddy, you know, and, and and Freddy's mom, you know, included like every one of them as a pact, you know, all defeat Freddy. It's not just the Dream Warriors; uh, it's all these people. If it wasn't been for Freddy's mom telling them Dr. Neil how to defeat Freddy, they would have never been able to defeat Freddy. So the Dream Warriors really don't even defeat Freddy, despite the fact that that's the title. And that kind of disappoints me a little bit. I think it should have been the Dream Warriors who ended up killing Freddy. But his death scene that we get makes up for it because it's pretty fucking cool. Uh, Dr. Neil is in the real world. He's like throwing Freddy's bones into the his uh, grave that he dug for him in the junkyard. And he puts ho throws holy water on it, sprinkles it on it. And it causes, like, uh, Freddy's body in the dream world to, like, shoot, like, holes appear in him and, like, light shoots out of it. He puts, like, a cross on Freddy's head. And not once, like, the cross, like, appears on, like, the, like, a uh, cross appears on Freddy's forehead right here. It looks really cool. Uh, and he just, like, jerks around, like, over and over in, like, fast motion. He fucking just, like, evaporates in the dust. That was cool. Uh, well, not fast motion, but he jerks around really fast, I mean, and then he just evaporates in the dust. That was cool. I really like that. Um, oh, before I forget, you got a funny scene in the movie where Dr. Neil is, like, trying to get the stuff, like the holy water and the cross and everything. He's in this uh, Catholic church, I believe, getting it, and the priest catches him taking the cross. And he's like, uh, I'm, I need this pretty bad. Uh, here, you can keep my driver's license. I'll reimburse you. You can keep my driver's license. And he's like, I'll be back. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. I wish that character of Dr. Neil, Dr. Neil would have came back in one of the other movies, but I don't know why he didn't. I guess they thought that would give the heroes too much of an advantage if they already had a character helping them who knew everything about Freddy as well, especially an adult. I guess they wanted to keep it in kind of like the teenage realm. But, um... So, uh, next day, it's Nancy's uh, funeral. It's Everybody's really sad. Christian's sad, but Dr. Neil is there with her. And, you know, the Kincaid and Joey, they're there with her, too. So, they're all trying to comfort her and trying to comfort each other. So, so it, it's kind of still a happy ending for the characters because the film franchise pretty much should have stopped here. And if, you, if people wanted to stop here after this one, I wouldn't blame them. I mean, I wouldn't. If fans wanted to just watch 1, 2, and 3 and then stop, I would, I would be fine with that. I mean... I mean, I think that's fine is what I'm saying. I don't think there's anything wrong with that.
one, two, and three pretty much end the franchise, really. Well, at least, well, three ends it. You could pretty much just watch one and two and consider that the franchise, really. Or one and three, I mean, not one and two, but you could just consider that the franchise. But, of course, all the films are the franchise. But I'm just saying, if you just wanted to watch one and three, because this is where the where the franchise should have stopped. If you just wanted to watch one, two, and three, I could understand. Some people like to watch one, three, and seven, but and call it the Wes Craven trilogy, but... This film was like changed so much from Wes Craven's original script that this really isn't a Wes Craven movie at all. But it's still a really good movie, and I, st I still think it's the second best of the franchise. Not my favorite, not my favorite sequel, but I still think it's the second best of the franchise. Um, we yeah, they're at the funeral and everything, and then Doctor Neil sees uh the nun one more time, who's a man. He finds out it's Amanda Krueger because he follows uh, her to her tombstone, which says Amanda Krueger, so he knows that she was Freddy's she was his mother, you know, Freddy's mom. And then for the ending, you get Dr. Neil sleeping, and then all at once, he's got Kristen's little uh, fucking Elm Street house that she painted and fixed up. Uh, and all at once, the light comes on inside the house, and then bam, end the movie. That's a little uh, neat way to end it, kind of like saying Freddy is dead, but he could possibly come back. That's a much better ending than what we've got in 1 and 2. This That little ending flicker is better than the ending of 1 and 2, but the film altogether is not as good. It's better than 2, but not as good as 1. Uh, and then after that, you get a badass fucking song by Dokken. It's the Dream Warriors. <laughs> Ain't gonna dream no more. Sorry, I had to bust it out. I just love that song. It kicks ass. Uh, Dokken rocks in this movie. And they did uh, they did a lot of the music for the movie, I believe. And that song right there is just like the epitome of 80s coolness. I just love that song. But yeah, this is a movie I really love. It's one of my favorite slasher films of all time. I really enjoy watching it, and um, I recommend that if you didn't like Part 2, I recommend don't give up on the franchise if you haven't seen any of the others yet. If you don't like Part 2, go to 3. You won't be disappointed. I don't think you will anyway. Um, but even though I like Part 2 and don't think it's that horrible, I still think this is a much better film than Part 2, me personally. Even though I like Part 2, I still think that this is a better film. But but yeah, if you've seen Part 2 and didn't like it, I say definitely give this film a shot. I think it'll change your mind on wanting to stick with the franchise if you felt like giving up on it after the second film. Sorry about that little cut right there. I just had to run and go do something real quick. So sorry about that. But uh, just to conclude this, like I was saying, I don't see why you would give up on the franchise though just after the second film, but if you did think in the second, but if you did think the second film was that bad, which I didn't personally, but if you did think it was that bad, then uh, I would say that this third film will more than likely redeem the franchise for you. But just to end this review, this is a four-star film. I have a possible four. Uh, it's not as good as the first film, but it's a lot better than the second film, even though I like that film. I still know that this film is much better than the second one. And I definitely recommend that you watch it. And I'll see you guys again with the Dream Master review, which is my personal favorite sequel in the entire franchise, uh, even though I don't think it's the best sequel. That honor goes to this film for me. But uh, I'll see you guys again with my review for A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, or in some people's eyes, The MTV, the MTV Nightmare. <laughs> so I'll see you guys again with The Dream Master review.